after an introduction like that, it's going to be hard to live up to. But uh, Michael was kind in his introduction because uh, he knows I actually have a lot of stories about him from when he was that cowboy. <laughs> we'll save those for later. I love it. He brings me to a dry campus. He has a guy talk about alcohol, and then he has a guy talk about juice. And I'm going to talk about water right before lunch. So we'll accept the challenge. But seriously, with so many uh, accomplished people in the audience, my Tom and Courtney speaking before me, very distinguished speakers in the afternoon, you're probably wondering actually why I'm here. Because I wouldn't, yeah, I have started a business, but it is, I'm definitely not your successful classic entrepreneur like I think both the people this morning have been. So why did Michael have me here? Well, he might have had revenge in mind, but I actually think that he wanted to bring somebody that was completely temperamentally unsuited for corporate America, and also equally unsuited for high-flying startups, particularly in high tech. And so that he'd see if I have survived and thrived in business, you can too. So I'm going to share a little bit. We're talking about creativity. That was kind of what he said, talk about creativity. And so we're really going to talk about resourcefulness, creativity, and we could talk endlessly about product, and that would be my um, always a preference. But I actually think about creativity in your own career, in your life, in how you lead your organizations, and in product a little bit. So with that, I'm going to try to leave you with a few take-home messages that I would take from um, a few from a little reflection on my career. Um, first of all, especially those of you that are graduating with your MBA, I never got mine. But I did graduate in the recession of 1982. And I wanted to work for the Nature Conservancy. It was like, I wanted to definitely save those outdoor places. Well, they were hiring PhDs for $10,000. And I didn't have a PhD, and I wasn't going anywhere. So I got my logistics training working for UPS part time uh, in the Christmas season. I built trail. I actually landscaped on Nantucket to get money to buy a one-way ticket around the world. In those days, a defunct airline, Pan Am, nothing like Virgin. But maybe when they started, they were like Virgin. <laughs> you could fly for $2,000. You could fly around the world, stopping as many places as you wanted, as long as you went in the same direction around the world. So I spent nine months doing that and got into China in 1983, right when they had just they'd opened three cities. They were just going to 27. Spent three weeks in China, and I was, I thought, these are the most natural capitalists anywhere. And it was very, I mean, there were the Mao jackets, and it was very, 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 you couldn't go anywhere. Um, nothing was set up. Nobody spoke English. It was a wild experience. But during that time, I thought, well, you know, business affects how people live more than anything else in the world. You know, business does. My parents were both doctors. Um, I absolutely think that they did far more good than bad, but I thought, you know, business really has the power to change, and that was a radical idea at the time. I didn't know that was particularly radical, but I was very cynical about school at that point, and I thought, well, I'm not going to get an MBA. That's a trade school. You know, I'm not going to do that. And uh, later on, I thought, well, I'll get an MBA and a divinity degree and study business ethics. So I went to Harvard and talked to them about that, and business school people looked at me and said, well, we have an ethics course. Why would you want to do that with a divinity school? So I decided that my personality couldn't stand going to business school because I think I was so competitive I would end up on Wall Street. And for me, that would have been, uh, would not have led me where my passion was. I candidly didn't understand Wall Street at that time. I still don't, but I've gotten to know it a little better. But you're going to spend the afternoon talking with experts about positive psychology and I think you talk about energy and everything else, it is absolutely about what drives you and makes you happy. Because if you don't look at the bright spots, and if you don't find those bright spots, then you're absolutely going to burn out. And if you're burned out, then you're not helping anybody around you as well. So um, after pounding the pavement, my first stop was the North Face. And my take-home le take message for you, number one take-home message from that job was, Make sure you connect with people and you thank everybody. It's very old-fashioned, but make sure you thank everybody along the way. I still have friends from the letters that I wrote trying to get a job to the outdoor people in the outdoor industry. You know, Peter Metcalf at Black Diamond and people at REI, none of them would hire me. So, uh, but I finally got a job at the North Face, and it was counterculture city in terms of where that company was. It was the most creative place. Um, 
I have been in maybe one of the most creative places I have ever been. They had a concept of the brand. It was a, a lifetime warranty. They had the catalog before Patagonia. The radical thing was in 1984, they still made everything in Berkeley, California. Everything, tents, bags, everything. Now that ended by 86, but the idea of being able to go there and live that was incredible. Now, everything was great about it, but it was missing one of your four pillars, as I understand it here, and that was that it had uh, a real vision for innovation and outdoors and, and extreme, you know, making the extreme outdoors accessible and comfortable and doable. It had absolute belief that it would stand behind its product. But it did not have a management team that was all together still. A lot of them had been fraternity brothers at Stanford. There were some investors behind it, but they did not stay unified and stay the course. And because of that, and they were spending a lot of money on retail, they were just blowing it out at retail. Because of that, it leads to my second take home, is you can't have misalignment of capital and you have to have a decent, you have to have capital that's aligned with your vision. You can't have people that want out of the boat all the time, and you have to have motivated capital too, and we'll talk about that. But um, even in that dysfunctional environment, they laid the foundation for what has become you know, an enormous successful company under VF. And that was absolute focus on the consumer and the innovation and what makes that eventually become a lifestyle company. And to that point, I got paid to go up Mount Everest. I mean, none of us got paid much to work there, but I got paid to go up Mount Everest, which at the time, they hadn't, people hadn't started paying to go up Mount Everest. It was, it was a new concept. But that investment, even at a time when the company was falling apart, paid huge dividends. And the product that we developed and the images we gave them, and it went on to become a really big basis. So they had it so close there, but I came away thinking, okay, I've really got to make sure whoever's got the money behind it can really fulfill that vision. So then I briefly worked with Paul Hawken, uh, who's founded Smith & Hawken, terrific business, uh, inspiring writer, and for some crazy reason, he agreed to work with me on what eventually became the Ecology of Commerce. We never did actually finish the book, but I was able to do, he really captivated me because he picked up that original idea that I'd had in China, which was, you know, for myself, was he wrote about it a different way. He said, business is killing the world. Nobody does it better. He also thinks nobody can save it more. That is, he goes on with that premise. But I did a fair amount of research in, for the original version in that, in that book. Didn't go on to write it with him, which was good, because I think his voice is, is far better. But I also think that Paul had a real vision for consumers, and he would never call them consumers. He called them customers. You want to be accustomed to buying. You want it to be a habit, if you will. And I think we're going to talk more about habits, because I think habits are incredibly important. You heard this morning about you know, changing the habit on juice. I'm going to talk about changing habits on water. But he thought that you should meet customers' expectations and then raise them. And that was what business did. Business wasn't in business. You're not in business to make a profit. Profit's boring, OK? You better make a profit or you won't be in business long, but profit's boring. It's actually what you're doing for somebody, whether it's experiential and increasingly it's becoming, having to become experiential, that that is what's really super important. So I ended up, I'm going to whole, skip the whole Silk for Life section because I want to go to see our designs because I want to hit a couple take home messages there and then spend some time on, on what's happening at Camelback. Um, the, at Sierra Designs, I don't know why I took that job, you know? You know, it's very hard to start a company, but it's very hard to turn a company around when consumers have lost sight of what it could be. But my vision of what it could be, and my vision of the simplicity and the essence of what the outdoor business could be again, because we'd gotten a little bit gimmicky, was we thought we could do it at Sierra Designs. Now, nobody else thought that because there were three product groups. There were sleeping bags, there were tents, and there was waterproof breathable, kind of clothing. And the clothing was called Hocus Pocus, and it was melting and coming back in the door. And the sleeping bags were flat, and they don't keep you warm when they're flat, and they were coming back in the door. And the tents had a 10% defect. It was, and Mountain Hardware was just started. They wanted to kill Sierra Designs. North Face wanted to kill Sierra Designs. Everybody wanted to kill Sierra Designs. Would never do it again. Terrific opportunity to learn some things. Number one rule box of chocolates. That is my theory of organizational uh, behavior and development. 
you want a box of chocolates. It's great if they're passionate about what you're passionate about, but when you're building culture, you want a diversity of people. Yes, it's absolutely great if you get gender, orientation, uh, age, everything aligned, but you also want different ways of thinking. I also, like Tom, tend to be very intuitive. You definitely want some people who are fact-based, but you want them, you want to allow for that quirkiness, and we had quirkiness at Tierra Designs. And we made, that a, we made that a real skill. But the first thing we did was, great, we have to take some bets. We're going to make tents strong again. We're going to try to make bags meaningful. And with clothing, it was very obvious that nobody had taken women's clothing seriously at all. And we were going to do that. But you're now to my fourth take-home message with, if everybody thinks it's a good idea, it's too late. Okay? So if everybody thinks it's a good idea, it's too late. It's also incredibly painful to be too early. Um, so we did suffer through a couple of years. In fact, the first time we brought out our line, convinced Gore-Tex to sell us again, I had my operations director was also worked at North Face, and I went in to see how we were doing with the new line and stuff. And Gore-Tex is, of course, the most expensive, so it was going to soak up all of our working capital. And with apparel, you have to make a certain minimum. So at North Face, if a product was a dog, we sold at least 1,500. Right? I go in there and I'm like, well, how are we doing with this product? And she's like, we've sold six. I'm like, six? You mean 600? She's like, nope, six. So uh, it was brutal. We were just were eviscerated that first year in it. We had you know, one of the best retailers on the East Coast tell me, it's like, Sally, this is a dumb idea. It's like women are never going to buy this. They're very finicky. You need 55 margin. You know, never going to happen. We stuck to it, and we got partners, and we, we eventually were like, yes, women will buy product if you actually design it for them, and it doesn't look like the men's product. So um, obvious, obvious breakthrough, but you have to get through retailers. You have to get through your own reps. You had to get out there to, to prove it. Then we took the thing of, like, Tom talked about it being obvious. Well, if you went in to buy a sleeping bag in those days, say you were um, a guy and a woman went in to buy sleeping bags, a really good specialty shop, like an A16, for those of you that know that one locally, would have sold you, if you said you wanted to do about a 20 degree temperature, that's where you were hiking, they would have sold you a 10 degree bag for the woman and a 20 degree bag for the guy. Because women's, women are sleep colder. Their metabolic rate's different. It's very clear. And we made sleeping bags like thermoses. You know, they were the same for each gender, they were the same amount of insulation, so it's your designs, we changed that. I was very excited about this. I thought it was really obvious. Go to one of the largest uh, retailers, and they tell me, well, nobody's ever asked for that before. And I was like, of course they haven't asked for it before. You know? <laughs> you know? Nobody can tell you what's going to be innovative. So um, they called those the Annie Oakley and the Calamity Jane, and they sold 16,000 the first year. So fortunately, we had some misses. We had some successes. But it was that idea of, we are going to take the essence of what had been Sierra Designs and remake it. And in that, we had to stay firm in our belief, and we had to know that truly, if everybody thinks it's a good idea, it's too late. Um, I left that um, when the company moved to Colorado. I left Sierra Designs, and I saw another need. I completely changed careers. And I did go into, uh, not Goldman Sachs, very far from Goldman Sachs, but uh, started my own. You can generally call us, generously call us an investment bank, but I was tired of watching the entrepreneurs in the outdoor business sell their companies. Um, they spent so long building them, and they weren't savvy um, like entrepreneurs are these days. They worried about payroll, they worried about the product, they worried about the customer. And they had really very little experience and clue about selling their company, such that when they needed money sometimes, they were taken for a ride. A famous climber was taken for a ride, 51% of his company. He didn't know what he'd done when he sold that much. Um, you know, moving comfort, sold, sold during a sourcing crisis. So we felt like there was real need, again, back to that capital. Back to capital for when, you know, guiding people in that, that transition, you know, and taking the expertise of Wall Street. Because the other alternative, you went to Wall Street and they got a bunch of money in. Um, so we formed Silver State Partners. Um, the name comes from a Robert Service uh, poem. And 
I had a partner, uh, Nate Pun, from Wall Street. Thank God, because you know what? I didn't go to business school. I didn't learn any of those financial models, and he could do that. But we had no idea whether we would be successful or not. We felt like intuitively there was this need. And we were able, within the first two years, to sell multiple companies, including Helly Hansen and Eagle Creek and Montreal. And part of that was helping entrepreneurs go through that process. Because that process has a lot of ups and downs. And it is incredibly important that you're taking what you're, you know, that you're taking your baby and not as many people are as lucky as Tom. A lot of people, it's a traumatic experience. But during that time, I um, got onto the board at Camelback. And I didn't want to get on the board at Camelback initially. I was just like, I'm busy. But it had been bought by a private equity company. And obviously, we sold companies to sponsors. I thought, well, they paid a lot. And I wonder what they're going to do with that company. And um, I thought the company could do some interesting things, but I knew very little about it. Boy, did I not know what I was getting into at that point. Um, but as Todd Skinner, who's a very famous, uh, he's no longer alive, but he was a very famous big wall climber, used to say, what you don't know, the mountain will teach you. And uh, it's very true. He would say, looking up at the base of this horrendous, unclimbable face, and work and work and work, and it is only the experience that teaches you. Now, Tom talked about it being a thousand times harder. It, it can be. But it was interesting coming into Camelback because we get to one of the next take-home messages, and I think I'm at five, maybe six at this point, because I think that number five would have to be what you don't know the mountain will teach you, because you do have to know that you're not going to know everything going into any business. But the sixth one is, you know, you have to take some bets. You have to take some bets, whether you're starting a company, whether you're starting your career, and you're going to be wrong on some of those bets. In fact, if you're not wrong, on some of them, you're, going, you're not trying hard enough. But if you're wrong, on more than 40%, you're probably out of business. So um, you have to kind of hit that line right. And Camelback was in a situation where it was a great brand, great company. For those of you not familiar, it had started in 1989 in West Texas, uh, at the hotter than hell. I'm probably not allowed to say that either, 100. Uh, had uh, IV, the guy sewed an IV bottle, I put an IV bag into a tube sock and sewed it onto his bike jersey. And that was the beginning of it. Uh, it was bought in 94 uh, by some very smart uh, financial people in San Francisco, and they grew it dramatically, and it had been sold for a ton of money, over $200 million in, uh, in the early 90s. And... Uh, no, 2000, sorry. I mean, 2000, right after the war started, the next war, not the first Gulf War, the second. And it was an unusual amount given the sales volume. It was a very high price paid. And I, so all of you know what private equity does. They put debt on it. So it was an over-leveraged company, very susceptible to a military downturn, and a company that defined itself so narrowly. It defined itself because it believed with an incredible passion that hands-free hydration, everybody would be using it. Okay, well, hands-free hydration doesn't roll off the tongue. Even the Army calls it hydration on the move. And yes, it is an awesome thing. If you are a soldier, you can defend yourself and still drink water. If you are a cyclist, a mountain biker especially. So it really grew with mountain biking. It went into military. It went into outdoor. And yes, we're an industrial, and there's plenty of places for hands-free hydration. But they were so rigid the other way they didn't look at water. And so what we did is came in and we looked at water. And we said, really, we borrowed from Jim Collins and said, what's been true from the beginning? What's been true from the beginning that will be true um, uh, all the way through Camelback's you know, entity? What's going to be true for 100 years? And it is, it's how we came up with our mission statement, which is to continuously reinvent and forever change the way people hydrate and perform. Well, we didn't have to talk about containers. So at that point, though I'm terribly disappointed to see our market share in this room, there is a better bottle. There's a better bottle up here. There's a podium bottle right there. All right, these people will be getting something after the, after the thing. 
But we really, we really transformed how people thought about it. We went in, the culture was fascinating culture. Um, it, the military group and within the company had decided they found the enemy, and it was the recreational group. Um, it was a company divided. But it was very simple to change some people and get people on the page behind that and the vision of eliminating bottled water, single-use bottled water. Now, a lot of you have it in the room, and I'm going to give you a challenge. Amanda's going to have, next week, 200 of our bottles, and yes, you can have glass, and those of you that think actually the carbon footprint's better on, on metal, you can have metal. And, uh, and, and you can have a Camelback bottle, because a Pepperdine professor here did a study for us, Holden McRae, of our bottle, which has the bite valve on it, and you will drink 24% more water than all those, those uh, unpatriotic single-use bottles out there that should be filled with 90% oil. So our vision, our vision is to obsolete those bottles because, candidly, it is unpatriotic. It's a waste of resources, and um, but I don't intend to shame you into it. You know, I intend to do it <laughs> by changing your habits. I might shame you today, but but we had to change the culture at the company first. We did that. The mission and vision are the ways of doing that, and now we're looking to activate. The bottles have grown explosively, but we care about water. The next step for us this year, we introduced a uh, purification product. So we are going far beyond. We give a lot of our, we are very active in outdoor, in bike, and military. We give to certain groups there, but we also give a lot to water.org, and we're focused on water. And you hear a lot about peak oil. You're going to hear about peak water. Water is rich, and water can build um, a large business and look at the $11 billion bottled water potential out there. But we have to do a better job. We have to make it more convenient. We have to make you want to change. We have to make you want to change that habit. And I think um, you'll see us over time. You know, We give water away at uh, Tough Mudder and, um, and music festivals. But you will see over time, and this product actually has a filter in it for all those places that I go, like Salt Lake and and uh, Las Vegas, where the water actually does taste terrible. So now I've got kind of a portable Brita here, so. Whoops. See, it doesn't spill. <laughs> so. so I think that uh, I do want to say that one of the things that we did, there was a question about culture earlier. I had some values that I really wanted to instill in the culture, but Camelback has a lot of engineers. And they were so literal. I was like, Really? I was like, you can't stake this and go here. I was like, we had to walk step by step by step. So integrating that culture and figuring out the values, it was one of the only times where we did a bunch of talking among all the different uh, sectors. And we have a factory in Tijuana, and we have distribution center down here, and we have overseas offices about what values that they could own. Because I didn't want them to be aspirational values. They have to be real values. And so they came down for us to be obsessively innovative. Now, a lot of people say they're obsessively innovative, but we will watch what we bring out in the next two years and see if we don't deserve that. And it's about water, for God's sakes. And your own, your own Pepperdine professor tells you to drink it. The other one Michael's going to like a lot, we give a blank. And you can fill that in in any way that you're allowed to here at Pepperdine. But... Uh, um, what that we say is we're fully dedicated to what we make, how we make it, and for whom we make it, and the way it affects people's lives and the environment. It's part of what we do. Are we perfect? No, we have absolutely feet of clay. But when we thought there was a problem with bisphenol A in plastics, we spent a long time and found it. And the Today Show like, did a wild story about it, and all of a sudden there was this panic about water bottles. And we decided to take whatever we wanted, we, whatever people wanted to send back, they could. We took a million dollars worth of bottles back. We were the only people who had the new version. And plastic is a great use of, this is a great phenomenal material here. A, I can go into that endlessly. But, um, but it was painful to stay behind those values, but we did. And it, it went on to, you know, I think it said a lot about what the brand was and what we stand for. And you know what? Our people wouldn't have let us do anything else. It was very easy for me to convince the board of that, too. And the other thing was rest stops are overrated. I say that, and I say that we push to be first, but we must also be the best. I don't want to say that we flog our people. Something I learned you know, at North Face, 
people would follow me 18 hours a day, and I had no problem doing that. I'm old now, um, and I want people to be sustainable too. So one of the things we're doing now is, what are those things, we have an active team, and what are those things that's going to make it a better place to work? What's that place that's going to keep you energized? Engagement's one of the buzzwords. But it's incredibly important because the talent gap and what you need to know now, things move quickly. It's really important. And the last one, of course, is people inspire us. That's probably why you're here today, um, you know, to be re-inspired. But we are blessed that we get to participate as an insider in everything from um, special operations to um, the best yoga instructor in the country. You know, we are blessed because water is universal. So as I look at it, and I didn't read a ton about the SEER program, right? But I do know Michael. But I would say one thing to you, that the SEER principles are kind of a given. You know, you're going to be on the wrong side of history if you don't incorporate those into your life, into what you're doing, and um, it is an expectation. You know, what has changed? I was totally devastated when I first went to Bangladesh. I haven't been back. Uh, because they had environmental laws, but nobody paid attention to them. Nobody paid attention to them, and lots of your products were made there. And the same thing could happen to the environmental laws that happened with the push about labor laws and labor audit. You know, there's so much power with consumers. It can be misdirected. We can go into, yes, they're wrong about certain things, and BPA has got issues in receipts, and there's all, all kinds of things that are out there. But the consumers have the power, and people expect you, expect good businesses to be that way. And you know what? You have to make choices. You have to make those bets. Because you can't do everything at once. At, at Camelback, we first spent, got the product right again. And then we've worked our way out. And we're always working on the team. You can't do everything at once. So in case you wanted a final rundown of my take home messages are, number one, connect with people and send thank you notes. All right, number two, make sure your capital is congruent with what you want to do and it's motivated. The capital that owned Sierra Designs was not motivated. They should have owned an apartment building. We could have been five times the size if we'd had any room to grow at all. So you want to have motivated capital, okay? And if everybody thinks it's a good idea, it's too late. Box of chocolates. What it takes to reach the summit can only be learned on the way. That's for all of you wanting to take the plunge. A lot of people who get their MBA now know too much to take the plunge. But if you take the plunge, <laughs> it's true. And, and then you have to take some bets. There's no way around it. There is no safe career. There is no safe option. There's nothing like that. There's all, you better do what you love because you could win and lose, and you will do both along the way. So questions for me? <laughs> Unbelievable. OK, Larry, do we have some questions? Yep, got one up here. Actually, I wanted to just share that I have um, a fourth grader who I walked into the classroom, and there are 19 camelbacks sitting on that desk in the classroom. All <laughs> right. So I wanted you to know that. And yes, they're drinking water, because I had a parent saying exactly that. If it wasn't for the um, ability of all these moms to buy into the camelback and all the kids sitting there in the classroom with their camelbacks, they're drinking water. and they're So you've got a generation coming up. Fourth Tell her grade, thank you for me. Years old, so you've got some longevity as well. But I also wanted to just say, Thank you for showing that age does matter, because I know lots of young whippersnappers in the room, but you need some wisdom <laughs> on your board. So, thank you. Happy to do that. My birthday's tomorrow, so I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions over here? Yeah, good. Excuse me. Oh. Hi, thank you very much for sharing what you shared. I have a question for you, since you mentioned diversity. And I've been to several uh, different uh, places and one of the things I see is that there aren't that many female leaders in business entrepreneurship sustainability whatever you want to say um, many different areas could you talk a little bit about what you faced or if you faced it or if you see something like that happening or has it improved from when you started was it ever an issue for you Okay, that's a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, the, I would say in the 
the direct industries that I work in that are um, outdoor and bike and military, they're absolutely male dominated. Um, the CEO of Patagonia back in the early days was a woman. They're probably, and the CEO at REI right now is, but there are, it's underrepresented even in uh, a forward looking industry like that. Um, I think in retail there are women, I think women ha have increasing there's increasing opportunity, but I, you've seen all the studies. Women don't make as much. There aren't as many opportunities. I would encourage women. There's two, two pieces of advice I have for women. One is not specific to women, but guys may do it more. Um, Jenny Chapman, a professor at uh, UC Berkeley's Haas School, talks about leadership, and she talks about knowing who to ask. Um, and I think that Courtney was talking about this. Oh, I can find somebody to ask. Guys can tend to build a, I need a little piece of paper to draw, but like a bad Lego, you know, construction of, of weird angles and weird endpoints. They're not afraid to have one person they asked about, what do you think about foreign exchange? What do you think about the Australian dollar? What do you think about this esoteric um, uh, topic over here about plastics? You know, they may have people that don't need to know everything about them, don't need to understand them. Women tend to like to have a smaller group of people that know everything about them. In business, that's a poor idea. You know, you want to create a big box of chocolates so that you get a lot of people and build your network that way. You know, you have your friends, but you can also have really good friends in business that, candidly, you only want to talk to them, one, them about one or two things. And I think that will help. And I think the other thing is, you know, I don't know about men are from Mars and women are from Venus and all that stuff, but, you know, I had three older brothers and, um, it's good to be able to speak guy, you know, you know, they, there's, and it's good to be able to speak God. the way women like to speak. So it's kind of, you want to, you want to listen because there's a different, there is a different aspect. It's kind of like languages, which we're terrible on in this country, but. Um, I learned about that, you, you speaking guy very early on when you looked at me and said, hey, that's my category, get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> As I told everybody, everybody at Camelback, when I came in, it's like, uh, if you're not direct, we won't work together very long or very well. So, <laughs> any questions? Yeah, good. Um, so, as a social entrepreneur, you, I, I'm hearing that a lot of times people start a business for two reasons: one, because there's a need in the market; they see something, you know, innovative, needed, but then they also want to do something good in the world. And if you're successful, eventually you get to the point where other bigger companies, established companies, are modeling what you've done because you've been so successful in gaining market share. And I feel like at some point those two values that you started with that were aligned suddenly are in conflict with each other. In other words, you've managed to grow the good part of you know making change happen because you're getting more people on board with that change but now you've created competition against you know your your innovative product so how do you reconcile that conundrum um, tell me if I don't answer your question but basically you competition makes you better and makes their increased interest in a category so you can either look at it like, oh my God, they're coming and you know, I don't have my IP or this, that or the other, but, or you can say, great, there's more discussion and how do we take advantage of it? On the other hand, I don't make any pretense to say that I don't make, I make, you know, I make consumer products. You know, it is not like, we are trying to change people's habits and make them healthier and drink more water and make it available and all those things, but we make consumer products. So I don't go over the top on, you know, that, we do our best to make it a great place to work. We do all the, we do the best, we have a lead building. We do, we go through and we do what we can. But I also think it's important to fool yourself. We all have feet of clay. Um, and we, you, we do the best we can. Sally, a question from the audience is, uh, uh, how is it selling into the biggest bureaucracy in the world, the military? <laughs> uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting. Um, the, uh, it's very rewarding and it's very different and there's probably 10 different ways that we sell in. The majority of our sales are, that are quote military uh, actually run our, our um, warfighters choosing our product. 
buying an exchange, buying an on base store, et cetera. So a big chunk of what we call military. We make this product for them. We don't sell it a lot of places, but they actually choose to buy it. Um, it's a, it's a, it can be frustrating and it can be, uh, I, I can go on endlessly for that. Um, it doesn't make you, uh, it makes you realize how hard it is to change the bureaucracy because you could be working with somebody. We're working on a very innovative thing for the military right now. It's never ever been done before. Nobody can do it. I don't know if we'll be successful doing it. I think we will. But it takes enormous amounts of meetings. It takes enormous amount of patience. And then when you've gotten to one point, then somebody gets moved every 18 months. So I don't actually know how you break that cycle. Um, and we go to trade shows where all of a sudden there's Boeing and there, you know, there's all this advanced stuff and there we are, Camelback. Um, so that's, that's interesting. But uh, it can be really rewarding. You get some great conversations. Of course, it's always great to sell the troops. That's the fun part. Um, but I don't think anybody there is not trying to do a good job. So, and we have experts that, you know, are real insiders on military speak. We cultivate that and we, we are very much part of that community as well. <laughs>